Okay, our last talk of the session is uh, astrometry at a very, very high precision, very, very close to Earth level. And Eduardo Benedict will uh, tell us about looking for the near Earth. Earth. Thank you very much, Chas. Um, everyone can hear me well? Okay, great. So my name is Eduardo Bendek. I work at NASA JPL here, a little bit of some miles away from here. Um, and one of my patients has been to search for Earth analogs uh, around nearby stars. Um, and with some other colleague like Ross Velikov and Peter, we have been pushing this, brainstorming how to do this. Uh, quickly. And there has been a plethora of concepts, direct imaging astrometry, but this one is particularly interesting, which is relative astrometry between the two stars. Um, there is an international team working on this project. There is a big effort in Australia as well, working on, a, on, on, on the same version on technology development, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but first, since we're in the US, I want to really take a message about the decadal survey. So the new decadal survey put a first priority area on the pathway to habitable worlds. And the message is very simple. It's finding the easiest of such planet to characterize. We have to find the easiest targets. And if we wanna characterize them, we are going to take direct imaging and we're going to measure the masses. Both techniques are sensitive to distance in contrast to radial velocity or to photometry. So we need to look for nearby stars. And if they're going to be Earth analog, they have to be FGK stars. So from my point of view, this message is really clear. Um, so how, what we have to do is to list those stars. We have to make the map. And for that, we need to measure the distance and their stellar type, and then look for planets. So um, then the second task of the decadal survey is to study them in detail. So again, direct imaging and measure masses. So for the large, large flagship missions, astrometry and mesh, mass measurement is particularly hard. I wouldn't say impossible, but has some challenges on very high accuracy of mass determination. So an astrometry counterpart of direct imaging, it's very important. And the rationale for measure masses, I think that most of us, we, we know why it's important to measure the masses. So um, I think that the message of the decadal survey here is crystal clear. Now, I think that there is another thing happening in the community. We're changing from demographic to habitability studies in case by case. So in the case of Kepler, we had this 3000 light year field and the signal was insensitive to distance. So we can go and look at as many stars as we want. This pull back a little bit closer to 200 light years, but then that's a 10 parsec sphere. That's where our best targets are going to be. And I took the time to scale that in PowerPoint. It was a pain. But anyway, so uh, this, that's roughly to scale. So we are really now focusing on the near stars. And that's what we need to do if we want to um, assess habitability. So we, we have to look at what the universe gave us. Uh, what the universe gave us is a neighborhood of so only 67 sun like stars within 10 parsecs only 67 and 41 of those are binaries. So that's pretty remarkable. More than half of those are binaries. Now, some of them, the binary companion is really faint. So, well, maybe doesn't really count as a binary, but a big bounty of this unique set of stars, because it's like, there's no more, that's it. That's what we have to work with, uh, has a large fraction of binaries of similar brightness. So there we have the sun, the farther away we go, uh, the harder it gets because of fainter and also smaller uh, distance of the habitable zone. And there we have the super hyper outlier Alpha Centauri, which is, is really remarkable. Um, we have been fascinated with this for a while. Uh, if you think about the next sun analog, which is Tau Ceti, so don't go to 10 percent, just look on the map to the next one. And uh, you see that any planet around Alpha Sen will be nine times brighter and three times higher resolution. So it really makes sense to, to look at uh, Alpha Sen. So observing an Earth analog at 10 parsec with a six meter 
UGUAR, LUGUAR, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's equivalent to observe alpha sand with a 60 centimeter telescope. And this is equivalent to an inner working angle and a photon uh, collecting level. So that figure is pretty amazing because now all the sudden you can use a telescope 10 times smaller if you are willing to observe nearby stars. Now, it's not that simple. I know that there are more caveats, but this is kind of a very back on the envelope calculation. Now, this time critical because uh, I'm sorry about the cannot because I've been corrected by people here that Gaia can observe alpha sand, but there are some limitations. Um, so we really need to understand what or which planets are here because we're designing the new missions and observing a magnitude zero star is not the same than observing, the, observing a magnitude seven star. So we really need to address this quickly before we have this mission design. Uh, let me quote here, they have a final report that actually said Alpha Centauri, if it's not for the fact that it's a binary, we would easily be the best target for assessing habitability. So now what we're doing with this project is using the problem as a solution. We'll use the binarity to solve the problem. So first, let's look at what there is at Alpha Set. So binarity and stellar noise limit the sensitivity of radial velocity, which has been the workhorse on this. And what you see there on this plot, there is um, basically the demographics of uh, nearby stars. And then you can see this was done by Russ Belikov on the SAC-13. And this is the latest update that he presented at Exoplanet 4. And what you see is that the likelihood of very interesting planets around Alpha Sen is, is quite interesting. So the fact that we haven't found an Earth analog around Alpha Sen doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So um, still this white area that is not explored is the most interesting for habitability. So where really things get interesting, we don't know anything. Why? Because we don't have the instrumentation, that's it. So we have to really understand and explore that knowledge gap. Um, so, well, I already said that. So here, um, again, if we take the binarity as a solution, we can use relative astrometry, which many people is already doing, um, but from space, and first, we should think about the scale of the signal. So if we look at, at Alpha Centauri and um, how it all planet will have a three micro arc second signal and typical performances, state of the art performance is on the order of 25 to 30 micro arc second. So here we have an image courtesy of Pierre, thank you very much, of, uh, that's taken um, of Alpha Sen A and B. They're saturating the detector, blowing everything out of it. And then, appear overlap the trajectory of the stars. And then we can see how the measurement is really measured the relative astrometry between those two and the modulation of that vector can tell us if there is a planet or not. Now, I wanna point out something that will come back later, which is their background stars. And those background stars are going to create a problem for us. And I'll talk about that later, but I'll bring to your attention that now. Um, so again, the opportunity that Alpha Sen offer us is the proximity. So if we're using astrometry, there is no other target that can have a larger signal for the relevant target for Earth analog. That's it, just distance and the brightness. So these are incredible facts from my point of view. A nine centimeter aperture can collect enough photons to beat photon noise of one micro second in six hours. A nine, side, nine centimeter telescope is like almost like a DSLR camera, but you're almost there and can collect photon noise or rich photon noise in six hours. So that's pretty amazing. Um, so I think the question that we have to ask ourselves, what is limiting us? Why we haven't do, why we haven't done this before? So I will already talk about photo noise. So photo noise is not a problem. Then the other question is stellar jitter, because this has been a really big deal for radial velocity. So is this a problem? And you can go back on the literature. You can look at all those papers. Uh, what you will find out at the end is that peer review literature agrees that a stellar jitter is not going to limit the detection of an earth analog. And the problem is scale with distance. So if you put the star farther away, your apparent jitter will go down, but also the exoplanet signal will go down. So it's, it's it, distance doesn't matter. But the problem is equally different. As long as we're talking about quiet FPK stars. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty an agreement. I'm 
if everyone has different information, please let me know because this is a fundamental problem. Um, the other element is distortion. So we go, we observe with our telescope and images are not exactly the same registration at the sky. And that, that's okay if it's static. The problem is when we come back to observe again, if that distortion, that registration have changed, then we're in trouble. And that has been one of the main limiting factors. I, I presented as PIE, a study that we did for Havex, how the distortion will map doing a Monte Carlo simulation. Long story, there's the paper, if, if you wanna see it, not that relevant for this talk. Um, and then there are the detector errors. So the detector error means that, for example, the other day I just went to one of my images, this is one of my data from the lab, and I just went in, zoom in, and I took a flat field, and that's what you get. If you narrow the cut, each pixel respond different light. Not every pixel does the same. And this is, the camera shows you only the intra, intra pixel response, but there's also variability on quantum efficiency within each pixel. So if the PSF moves, then what you, what you get is noise because each pixel behaves differently. And otherwise you end up with milliard second pointing to avoid that your PSF move, which is really difficult. So at the end of the day, this is the other term that we need to deal with. And there are approaches with laser metrology and all, but uh, here we, what we propose is a diffractive pupil approach. And this approach address both of them, the distortion and the detector. And let me tell you a little bit about this. So, like on many other things, Olivier Willon started on this on 2012, and I was his PhD student, and what he proposed is to create these infamous microscopic dots on the primary mirror of the telescope that will create diffraction spikes, like what you see on the right. So then you have the background stars, and then there are diffraction spikes, and the diffraction spikes are nothing else that fiducials and replicates of the main PSF all over the field of view. But guess what? When the field of view distorts, then the spikes distorts and you can map and calibrate out distortion. Um, so I, Catalina is working with me and she's reducing lab data because I have a, a lab at JPL working on this at TRL5 in vacuum, it's really cool. And you can see her poster number 46. Yes, number 46, if you wanna see how this data is reduced. And also Mad Noise has a port poster 53 showing this uh, about the lab implementation. Um, but then you can say, okay, if we're looking about binaries, what do we do? Well, in the case of binaries, what we can do instead of having these diffractive uh, spikes, we can reconfigure the diffractive pupil, the elements, the diffractive elements on the pupil to optimize it for binary. So in that case, what we do is we create a pattern in which there's kind of a flower pattern that maximizes energy gradient uh, on these fringes that allow us to have a very good clamp at the plate scale and also allow us to average detector errors because we are spreading the PSF over 1800 pixels. So now when the PSF moves, we're averaging the, the detector errors, the same with the spikes. Now that's a waste of photons. Yeah, but we're not, we're not photon star. We're photon star for the background stars, but not for the target. Uh, so that's a key and also solves another, diff another problem. When you look at a nearby star and wanna do astrometry with respect to the background, you saturate that star. So matching the brightness of the background and the target is very important. Anyway, so here it's an image of one of the incarnation of the, this binary pupil. So it's a variation of the diffraction element that you need to put in the pupil that is optimized for a different observation. Uh, what is shown here is topography. So that means the surface on the mirror. Black is quarter of a wavelength lower than white. And uh, what you get out of this is basically that flower pattern that I was showing before that has a, several properties that allow you to calibrate distortion. Now, uh, I wanna highlight uh, Louis as work, he has a poster here. He is really the black belt optimizer of uh, pupils. He has amazing code called the looks, which he, you give a merit function that you tell what you wanna optimize and then the code does an amazing job optimizing this. So please uh, see Louis' talk, uh, poster is really cool. And also, well, all this work is led by Peter Tuthill in Sydney. 
So uh, Peter has a big effort on, on this area, but also they got funding from uh, uh, Breakthrough to apply a technology development version of this vision. So JPL and, and Sydney are trying to collaborate to push the effort to conclusion. Um, so now I wanna tell you a little bit more of our concrete effort at JPL, that's called JNEX because it's internal funding at JPL and what we're doing. So the goal is to demonstrate this technology uh, and the science is to survey the habitable zone of alpha sand for plants. And, I, and I, I really wanna underscore the importance of finding an earth analog around alpha sand. That would be a major revolution, I think. So it's really exciting science. Here uh, we have, um, we, we develop a mission concept and that mission concept um, has a duration of one and a half to two and a half years. And it's supposed to be on low earth orbit or um, sun synchronous orbit. And there is a trade of cost, aperture and duration to get more sensitivity. And this shows, uh, this plot on the right shows on the horizontal axis, the orbital period and on the vertical axis, the mass. And then the black line shows the sensitivity limit for one and a half years and for two and a half years. And what is shown here between the purple line, which is the radial velocity limit and the black line is the knowledge gap. Well, the knowledge gap goes all the way to the bottom, but uh, basically this is our bounty. This is our, the region where we wanna look for. Uh, same for alpha SMB. So this is basically the bottom line. This is a takeaway science for Ptolemy. Now you can move these lines a little bit, changing the configuration, mission duration, but that's basically in a nutshell what it is. So how the mission works is you go and take your favorite CubeSat, you put a nine centimeter aperture telescope on it, uh, you put it for two years observing Alpha Centauri non-stop, except that the Earth is going to get on the way. So sometimes you have to do, well, every orbit, every 30 minutes, you have to do an avoidance maneuver. Um, and because you collect so much data and you have so many epochs, at the end you can achieve incredible precision. So on a baseline case, um, we can do one observation per orbit. Each observation will be 9,000 frames of 200 milliseconds each because otherwise you saturate the detector. And the PSF contains the calibration. So that's the raw data, basically this flower that I was telling you before, which is the PSF spread by the diffraction. And this is what we call level zero raw data. And that raw data is downloaded and it's converted into astrometry vectors. Now, what you can see here, this is the amplitude of the astrometry vector over one orbit. This is one orbit, that's the next orbit. And what you can see in red is the expected astrometry vector. And that's a change on the astrometry vector because telescope expansion with the change of thermal effects. And then we apply the calibration the diffractive pupil calibration, and then we have a flat line. So we remove the bias, but still have noise. So then we take all this data from one orbit and convert it into one data point. And then that data point goes into a time series and that time series get fitted by any of the beautiful tools that we have been learning this week. And at the end, we get masses and planets and orbits. So that's, that's in a nutshell how it works. Now, uh, we have been working on an error budget. I'm not going to go in detail on this because I'm going to run out of time, but it's, 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 it's pretty thorough. Uh, but I do wanna go on the categories. So on the left is the astrophysical noise. So uh, photon noise and detector noise. Uh, sorry, on the right is the astrophysical noise, background stars, stellar jitter, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the noises from the telescope and that's defined that requirement. So this is the way that we design the mission and that uh, we can change the parameter depending on telescope approach. And here, one thing that for this community, I would like to get your attention on, we are building an end-to-end -end simulator because astrometry mission is not like a chronograph that you either take or not take the image. This is really about at the end of the mission, you really learn if you get the data or not. So we are going to do an end-to-end -end simulation and the end-to-end -end simulation start with the universe and we propagate an electric field to the entrance of the telescope. And then the telescope, we have a simulation that generate the images. And then we recover the astrometric vector from the PSF. And then we do the planet's retrieval on the detection. So um, then we can compare the data we injected, we recovered uh, data. 
And here in parallel, we have a laboratory demonstration to prove that our distortion calibration assumptions are real, that we can do that. So this is working. Uh, we have done the first um, universe simulation and the first instrument simulation. We recover the astrometry vector from the instrument simulation and we recover planets. So now we are adding more noise to this. Background stars, stellar jitter, and et cetera, et cetera, to make it more realistic. Uh, so Eric Nielsen has been leading the uh, exoplanet retrieval from the time series. And we have this endless loop of iteration when you generate, a, you have a mission design and then generate a data set doing the orbital fitting. Do we meet the requirement? Yes or no? And we come back and we optimize. This work is really uh, time consuming. Uh, and um, I'm asking for funding for next year. So if you're interested on um, working on the models and solving many of the challenges that we have, like adding radial velocity information to the astrometry, resolving how start the generacy, et cetera, et cetera. Let me know because uh, we are interested on, on adding fidelity to our models. Um, finally, uh, this may not be relevant for people in this community, but still I wanna give you a, a sense of where we are. Uh, we have completed a TRL3, so that means that we tested that this on the lab works. Now we're doing a high fidelity demonstration in the lab, and we are asking for funding for next year, go in vacuum at high fidelity, but also to complete our modeling effort and show that we can do this end to end. The goal is to be on 2024, ready for a larger mission proposal and to, to, to develop this. So I wanna quickly show a little bit of uh, the work that we're doing on the lab. Matt Noyes here that is presenting the poster has been leading this. So we have a, a universe simulator and this universe simulator is capable of injecting an astrometric signal between the binaries. And um, it's very sophisticated with magnets and laser metrology and all that. And it's really amazing. So here there is a version of it. Um, we can control 200 picometer steps. So we can move two sources with 200 picometer steps and with, with closed loop. So we, we can measure the 200 picometer with the laser metrology and that blows my mind. That's the diameter of a hydrogen atom. So it's, it's really cool. This is all in vacuum and stabilizing. Um, so see Matt's uh, poster for that. And uh, this is a, a cut of the layout. I didn't have the real lab images released on time by JPL export control. So sorry about that, but believe me, there is real hardware there. Uh, these are the only images I could have released on time. Um, but anyway, the takeaway is uh, finding planets. Uh, the, our charter is really finding the easiest planets and explore them. Alpha Centauri is really a gem. Uh, it's really unique. And finding a planet there will change the game a little bit for us interested on Earth analog. I know that there is other science. It's not the only science, but I'm just speaking for my own passion here. Uh, technology, narrow angle astrometry is amazing for binaries. I'm not the only one here saying that. There's many people that find out that a long time ago. And uh, astrometry appears is limited by optical distortion and detector error. So working those two problems is key. Uh, the implementation, there are many implementations. As I said, uh, Peter Tathill has a funded technology demonstration effort at Sydney. So please talk to him as well if you're interested in CubeSat. Uh, we are aiming uh, for a little bit longer game, a larger mission, but we are collaborating to, to do both. So I think that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I actually just asked one mission class, is this uh, where to fit into the cost cap for pioneers? Yeah, so you can scale this mission to different sizes. So the smaller version is a nine centimeter CubeSat and just observe Alpha Centauri. And uh, depending who builds it, I mean, NASA has a different cost level than uh, a university or anything, but that's going to be in the order of 10 million. Uh, 10 to 20. If you go for a 20 or 30 centimeter aperture, then you can observe 14 binaries and then you're on a much larger budget cap. But it's still very small, uh, small mission for NASA 
tile clustering. So you can scale these. They're natural astrophysical needs on these. Like you go from alpha sen, and then if you want to jump, then it's not like a continuous. So there's natural scaling of the telescope aperture that does make sense to address many more stars. So it's normally nine centimeters, then 25, then 25 to 30, and then, well, then it gets a little bit more continuous. Okay, so we have a path to at least one nearby Earth. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So on. Uh, yeah, very cool stuff. I hope this uh, all works out. Um, can you say a bit more about the name of the mission? This was not the... Okay, yeah. So Toliman is the name of Alpha Centauri of the natives, native people. So there is a lot of uh, natives. So that's in Australia. In, in Chile, we call this Lukai. Lukai is the native people, or the native name of Alpha Centauri. Yeah, Alpha Centauri is minus 60 declination. I grew up like the Southern Cross, like when I would like, get lost, my dad would say, hey, look at the Southern Cross. And, then, and right next to it is Alpha Sen, it's magnitude zero, so it glows like crazy. So local people, local indigenous people call it Lukai. Uh, other people uh, call it Toliman. And so at the end, Toliman kind of is easy to pronounce and also has a, Peter found a really cool acronym that I cannot even remember. <laughs> it's about how the locus motion, maybe Peter, you can say what it is. Sorry, I cannot remember, but he, he managed to figure out that very cool. So at the end, kind of the name catch up and people start to resonate on the community. So on this concept, it's, it's hard to kind of get on the, uh, on, that people get familiarized. So just get to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we thank the speakers at the second.